So what do you think? Scary stats? Let me ask you, which one of those statistics is most relevant to you? Is it number one, more people have a mobile phone than a toilet? Is it number two, there are 650 million people on this planet without access to safe water? Or is it number three, on average, you check your phone 150 times a day or every six minutes? Show of hands, number one, most relevant to you. Number two, most relevant to you. Number three, now the third was pretty easy because all the threes put up their hand with their cell phone in their hands. <laughs> Let me ask you a slightly different question. Which one is most significant to you? One, two, or three, number one, most significant in the grand scheme of things. Number two or number three? Yeah, we'd probably say that number two is, because if we don't have water, we have what? About seven days to live? Pretty significant. But I'm here to argue that the third one is becoming just as important. And why? Because we've been seduced by technology. It offers us an escape. Think about it. We walk down the road, what can we do? We can escape the world. We sit on our couch, what can we do? We grab out our device, we can escape the world. We stop at a stoplight, what do we do? Hopefully we don't pull out our device. We stop, right? But we're so seduced by this technology. I mean, isn't it great? We can escape for hours and hours and hours. We can plan vacations. We can shop online. We can learn a language. We can do all these wonderful things. We can even keep up with the Kardashians on Instagram. But at the end of the day, we can power that device off. And we can go to sleep at night knowing that we have a roof over our head. Knowing that we have water. Knowing that in the morning when we wake up, everything will be fine. And we'll just go back to our busyness over and over and over again, right back on the wheel. So what I want to talk to you about today is, is not how technology is bad or not how we can save the planet. I want to talk about you. I want to offer a fresh perspective. Because I really think, really, really think that we're losing perspective on things. So the beauty of events like this, we have 18 minutes here. We escape work. Don't be thinking about your emails. Don't be thinking about all the things that you're supposed to do. Let's put our devices away. Let's really, really engage. Old school, in person. What do you say? You ready? I don't think you're ready. Are you ready? Much better. Welcome to Wi-Fi versus water. How can we find humanity in this digital world? Now, let's start with perspective, because perspective is everything. Some people have these problems. No water, no food, no shelter. Other people, which I think is the majority of us, hopefully is the majority of us in this room, we have these problems. No Wi-Fi, low battery, and of course, the spinning wheel of death the app that will never load. <laughs> How does that relate? How did our perspective change? How do we get so uptight when there's no Wi-Fi signal in the room? How do we get so uptight whenever we lose battery? How come we can't just always remember, hey, well, it's better than not having water? Why can't we remember these things? Because I think over time, once we have the basic needs, what are we just supposed to do? Hey, we got, it. We got everything we want, so let's just sit back and enjoy them. No, we want to innovate. We want to do things. We want to use technology. We want to see how far we can push ourselves. We want to test the boundaries. And throughout evolution, I think what, what has happened is tech got smart and we didn't. We started creating all these devices to replace us, right? Because it's, it's hard to remember where we're supposed to drive to. Has anybody ever lost their phone, by the way? How have you felt? I lost mine two months ago in San Francisco. Thankfully, some really good person actually sent it back to me a week later. But without, for that week, I was without it. Now, part of me was liberated because I, had, I don't have my phone. I can't answer email. I can't answer. It was just it was freedom. But yet, whenever I had appointments or I had to go somewhere, I didn't know where I was going because we rely on that device so much. I mean, we need a PhD to flip burgers at Burger King, but yet we need a... We, we, 
we lose our device, we feel lost. So is that really getting us smarter? For me, it all started in the late 50s. Now, I wasn't born yet, but we're in Tech Valley here. So it's all about the integrated circuit. Think about our evolution, our inventions. When the integrated circuit came out, what happened? What was next? The internet. We connected everything in 69. Then it was those big mobile phones. Remember those in the 70s? You need to work out for a week just to lift them. Then we got to a smartphone, which was really the gateway to this interconnectedness, this internet thing. It allowed us to be captivated and have access to everything. And now we have, of course, the internet of things. What a great idea. Has anybody ever seen a smart fridge before? Can you believe you can go to the store, you can buy some milk, you can come home and your fridge will scan it and it'll tell you when it expires. Fantastic. Then, of course, we have self-driving cars like Tesla. We have cyber pills, monitor blood pressure. And, of course, my favorite, if you've ever been to Japan, <laughs> this is the place to have a really bad meal. <laughs> it's called a washlet. It is the most advanced toilet on the planet. Like, when you literally walk into the stall, the seat comes up and it kind of greets you, hello. <laughs> Music starts to play. There's a seat heater on there. It's like a spa for your private parts. It's fantastic. So the Internet of Things, again, technology is wonderful. But what's the repercussions of that? Or what's the other side of it? Too many choices. This is my experience at our grocery store last week. I need to buy detergent. Now, did you know that Todd has like 50 billion kinds? There's cherry, there's lemon, there's fruit, there's mint, there's basil. Do you really think that the one that I pick is going to matter in my life? Probably not. But how long do you think I sat there and looked at them? Which one should I pick? I needed to phone a friend. Too much choice. Too much choice. And research has proven when we have too much choice, we have analysis paralysis, we waste too much time, and then what happens is we have unrealistic expectations. Because we think more is better. This is the world we live in. We're always constantly trying to do more with less, more with less, more with less. How can we automate it? How can we get to that next level? More, 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 more. So now our expectations are off the charts. Ladies, I'm sure you shopped at Zappos before. What's their policy? You buy shoes, you don't like it, how long do you have to return them? 365 days. Unrealistic expectation. How do you compete with that? Zero down, don't pay until 2020. Unrealistic expectations. It's the virtual world that has said, hey, we'll give you everything. You don't have to do anything. But yet we still have these real world problems. Let's pull it back to perspective. Along the way, so let's look at this timeline. We tried to get smart, we developed all these smart things, the circuit came out, we got entrapped, and it was all about getting smarter. Smarter, smarter, smarter. Intellectualizing everything. Big data. Ooh, big data. Not to say that big data is bad, but what has it allowed us to do? Not make choices, because the data is there. Hey, well, the data says it, so we don't need to take responsibility for it. Data says it. The part that we've neglected is our emotional side, our emotional brain. And I think we're doing schools and kids a real injustice because whenever they turn 16 and 17 and they start to deal with failure, they've never really experienced anything or they've never been taught or they've never been communicated to in such a way where they're allowed to express their feelings. And same thing with our evolution. We tried to get smarter. Anybody remember soft skills in school? Communication skills, human skills. Has anybody ever worked in tech before? You have a job there for 20 years. That's how I started. My first company was in tech. 20 years, and then they promote you. You were happy with the computer. Now you've got to manage people, but you've never been taught. Total different world. And what else does emotion do? What else does emotion do? Do you think that we make our decisions based on logic or emotion, primarily? Hey, show of hands. Logic? Some guys try. <laughs> Come on. Or emotion. 
Emotion is the missing ingredient. Could you think this? You think this. Martin Luther King started a movement. Do you think if he would have came up and said, I kind of have a dream. Here's the data that supports it. And here's the algorithm we're going to use. Do you think he would have moved anybody? Absolutely not. I was in Singapore several years ago, and I was doing an event, and there was a guy there also speaking. He was from Texas, big, burly Texan, used to work on Wall Street. He came out to me, and he said, Craig, the quality of questions determine the quality of your life. And I thought, whoa, this is pretty deep. You know, Texas, Wall Street guy. But I never really appreciated that statement until I had kids. How many people have kids here? Show of hands. How many people were a kid at one point in time? <laughs> when your kids go to school and they come home, what do you ask them? How was your day? What do they say? Fine. Good. So if I, is that a good question? No, it's a terrible question. Why? Because if we leave the relationship there, what happens? We don't know anything about our kids. You go into work. You see your colleagues. What do you say? Or do you just try to scoop by them? <laughs> How are you doing? What do they say? Good. It's like a like on Facebook. Click, click. It's easy. Or how's the weather? The weather, oh, it's rainy outside. Well, yeah, gee, thanks, tips. <laughs> you know, we make up this frivolous conversation. And in some of the work I do in engagement, people come to me, managers, C-suite, they come to me and say, well, I can't motivate my people. I say, well, yeah, have you ever talked to them? Have you ever asked them a better question? So let's bring it back full circle here. This is about perspective. It's about understanding the real challenges of the world out there. It's about the things that we can actually do to have a greater impact. So although we're not impacted directly yet, we're all one. It doesn't matter your race, religion, your beliefs, where you're from. The world's shrinking. We need to start asking better questions. So five for you. The first one, what tech boundaries do we need to set? You ever thought about that? How many people allow devices around dinner time? Have you been, ever been out in a restaurant? How long does it usually take before everybody pulls out their phones? And it doesn't matter where you are. I was in the Middle East 2014, gold medal game, Canada, Olympics. Beautiful place. 30 people, big round table. It wasn't a minute before everybody had their devices out. Now, I had an excuse because Team Canada was playing. But we all had our devices. We weren't communicating. We weren't being human. So what boundaries can we set? Number two, who? Who do we need to connect with? In real life, not online. Number three, how can we contribute? Let me ask you this. Show of hands, how many people were super, super excited to get up this morning? Now, don't lie. <laughs> I know what you were thinking. It's 7 o'clock, hit the snooze, hit the snooze. How many people enjoy the work they're doing, show of hands? Are your bosses here? <laughs> Let me ask you a better question. At the end of the day, are you happy when you've come home and you've looked at your day and said, yes, I actually contributed to something? Show of hands. Figures, it's a TED audience, so. Because <laughs> research doesn't suggest that at all. Do you know what the number one thing for job satisfaction is? Show of hands, money? No. Show of hands, title? Show of hands, contribution. 100%. You want to know that you matter, that you contribute to something. Think about it. You work so hard on a project and the boss or the manager goes, yeah, yeah, yeah we're not going to do that. How do you feel? Just wasted my time. We want to contribute to something. We're social beings. We're social creatures. We want to contribute. We want to be part of a community. Number four, why, why do we need to do something about it? If we don't, are we just going to kick the can down to the next generation and go, not our problem? Well, here's the reality. Things are going to change more rapidly in the next 20 years than they have in all of the history of 
our being. So we better get used to it. So we can either lead the change or we can be forced to change. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to be? Some scary stats about water. Within the next 20 years, if the trends continue, demand will outstrip supply by 40%. Not our problem yet. Oh, we live in Canada. We have lots of water. It's great. Really? Within the next 20 years, 45% of our jobs will be automated. So how do you see it? How do you see it? Do you see this? Opportunity is nowhere. Are we just going to lie down? Go, well, status quo, it is what it is. Just let life happen to us and hope for the best? Or do we see this? Do we see opportunity now? Not only to solve our water problem, but to really put things in perspective. Why we're busy all the time, yet we have time to check our Facebook status you know, 35 times a day. Oh, I'm so busy, I can't do it, I can't reply. I'm always going, I just wish life would slow down. It's so hard, it's so this, it's so that. Simple changes. We don't have to save the planet, that's not the point. The point is if we do small things, we can have a big impact. And if we all do it, guess what? All of a sudden it becomes a movement. And that's my hope. So when do we start? What do you think? Should we wait for a New Year's resolution? Should we make this a fad diet or some trendy exercise? Or should we try to start something that has a great impression that's long-lasting? Obviously, we need to start now. Because here's the reality. I always like to say that I've won the lottery of life because of where I, born, I was born. We don't have a choice, right, as to where, when we were born. But now we have a choice as to what we can do while we're here. And the reality of it is, if life expectancy is 80 years, that gives us 42 million minutes on this planet. Now, we're all not just born, so there's going to be a little bit off of that. So what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Thank you for giving me 18.